diplomatic service in Paris and Germany. We ended our career in Norway, and that's also about 1956, looking as though we were going skiing. Here's a painting Paul did from one of those saved churches in Norway. It's a wonderful country. Paul just loved taking photographs. This is me taken somewhere on the frozen lake up in the north. Look at this, three, three lambs in front of their farmhouse. They look very cozy indeed. This, I'm sure this is Bergen Harbor because I recognize those wooden houses back there. And here, an old wooden house with sod roof under the snow. Oh, they bring back fond memories. You know, recently, I was so lucky to have a chance to go back to Norway after 25 years have to ask me twice. is this. 
this one, the town hall, boasting twin towers and a fine clock. It's here that the city council has its meetings, and it's a great place for concerts. Here, a visiting Lithuanian folk ensemble is rehearsing. Kovar was very proud of the murals that cover the interior spaces. The war theme in all its horror and destruction is recalled here. It's a powerful, somber reminder of that unthinkable time in this tiny nation's history. While it may be true that memories of World War II have all but faded from the American scene and elsewhere, that has not happened in Norway. Here, among these vivid images, you are not allowed to forget. No. 
flour. But you could have not put in the butter and not put in the cream. And that... Well, this is for a party. I don't think we need that much. Uh -huh. oh. And the dish. Then I think now we can put in the dough. That's going to be just delicious. Mm -hmm. Like this? I think that is done, don't you? Yeah. Like this? That's lovely. Put a little bit on the on other side. On the other side. side. Yes, that's the certainly, certainly fast. Is anyone coming home from work and certainly get a nice dinner ready in no time? But see, we, we need about a liter and a half of strawberries to put into the food processor to go along with the Ingrid's butterfly salmon. I volunteered to do the dessert. They managed to find me some sensational locally grown strawberries. And we just whipped up a quick sorbet. Um, I wish I could uh, have spoken English better. So I... You speak wonderful English. I think I wish I could speak... Wouldn't it be fun to have Ingrid on our TV? They say there are more Norwegian Americans living in America than Norwegians living in Norway. So finding a sympathetic audience for her shouldn't be difficult.
over. Yes, it is. It's really winter and summer recreation for the whole town, isn't it? Next stop, the ski lift. Everybody in Oslo, including good King Olaf, before he died recently, skis. This sculpture showing the skiing king and his dog, Crow, is never without flowers. Tribute from his loving subjects. Oh, well, it seems to me that that frightening ski jump is even more so. Did they add on to it? The ski jump itself is not far away, and it is impressive. Begun as a much smaller jump years ago, they've added height to it several times until now it is some 300 feet high. And here is that monstrous jump. <laughs> you, have you yeah. done it yourself? <laughs> no, I'm not jumping. I, I ski, yes. But in 1952, this was the setting for the Winter Olympics. Fish. <laughs> now, what is this water there in there now? What? Uh, when they drain out the water, when they jump oh, so they in the winter. Yes. They had plenty of good snow that year. So when the jumpers threw their bodies off this run, they were traveling at 50 miles an hour. I was told that jumpers with good form might sail out over 350 feet, landing just short of the lake. Photo taken in 1904 
the Osberg ship is being excavated with the remains of two women aboard. One is thought to be a queen, the other her serving woman. The Osberg ship appears today in a remarkable state of preservation, perhaps because it was buried for all those years under tons of blue clay. Oh, well, this has been wonderful. It's really a kind of religious experience. Uh -huh. <laughs> Your part. 
when we were here in the 50s and the sensation the sculptures created. Oslowans take them pretty much for granted these days, but not so the hundreds of thousands of tourists who flock here to be photographed among the statues of Gustav Vigeland. Vigeland labored 40 years on these stone images, depicting man's birth, youth, middle and old age, and finally, death. The focal point being this monolith carved from a single piece of stone weighing 60 tons. I remember not being alone in my loathing of the Vigeland statues when I first saw them. Now, nearly 40 years later, I loathe them still, but the tourists sure like them. Well, I must say goodbye to Toba because we're off to Bergen. It's been a pleasure having you here, Julia.
big accident during the war. Uh -huh. There was an ammunition. One incident that during that World War II still, still remains fresh for Nino Cimino. Uh, he was a little boy then. Bergen was a submarine repair facility for the Germans. As such, the city came under occasional Allied bombing attacks. He told me a favorite sport among the young men was to rush out seconds after an all-clear to try to find and pick up still warm fragments of bombs. But one day the explosion came not from Allied bombs, but from carelessness aboard a fully loaded munitions ship, which was undergoing repairs in the harbor. A welder's spark ignited the cargo, causing hundreds of casualties, fires, and damaged every piece of glass within a 15-mile radius of the city. The explosion made quite an impression on Neil Semir, who remembers the chaos it caused nearly 50 years later. After lunch, Neil Semir suggested we visit Trollhagen, the former home of Bergen's favorite son, Edvard Grieg. Grieg labored here at his lakeside estate for over 20 years. The cottage where Grieg lived with his wife and family is now a museum and has been beautifully restored. There's a lovely pussycat. Yes. Maybe that's a descendant from the Grieg. Perhaps. Oh. <laughs> the popularity of Grieg's work is surprisingly high even today almost a century after his death. It's not uncommon to find dozens of recordings featuring his music in any Norwegian record store. The next morning, we left Bergen Harbor for Niels Emil's fish farming operation.
after years of experimentation, choosing the right breeding stock, finding the most effective feed, computerizing the delivery and monitoring systems, and observing which locations provided the optimum results, the Norwegians now have the most advanced fish farming industry in the world. So this is a processing plant for harvesting salmon. Mm -hmm. With the fish inside this boat, exactly, is it? Yes, the next stop on our tour was a processing plant located a short boat ride from the farm. Tied up at the dock when we arrived was a well ship. Look at those. Those are big fish, aren't they? Yes. Uh, a well ship is a vessel that has a large storage hole filled with seawater to transfer up the live fish from the farm to the plant. Then it is just a matter of dipping them out of the well ship and up onto the stainless steel sluice way. Surely this is the toughest job. At this station, a cold, wet man grabs each fish as it slithers down the runway, then quickly and skillfully dispatches it. Then the fish enters a tank where it is bled and chilled with ice water to lower the body temperature and prevent spoilage. With the fish still in ice water, they are transported to the processing plant in big boxes where they're gutted, cleaned, and graded. That is very important that the fish is properly cleaned so that oh, you can... Yeah. Meet the inspector, a government man. He's been present at all stages of the operation from well boat to the plant, making sure that nothing gets through that isn't first rate. At this station, the fish are graded according to appearance. Those judged the best are called superior, and they get a special metal tag.
my energy on sightseeing, not if I'm going to be ready for fishing very early tomorrow morning. The next day we set out at dawn for the Ostra fishing camp, where I would try my hand at fly fishing, something I hadn't done for years. The farm is owned by the Ostra family. What good sports they were to let a stranger like me have a go at their prized salmon river. Olaf, can anybody come and be a guest here? No, this place, listener, is a private home. Oh. And uh, you have to be invited to come here. So you have somehow to meet the host so that you can be invited, is that yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Olaf Venderbu and his family have lived in this valley for generations, where he not only manages the estate, but also tends to the considerable orchards and the potato farm. How clear. On the day of our visit, Olaf explained that every bed was taken here at this luxurious private camp. Think of it. Some of Norway's most important people might get to see me catch my fish. Oh, and there's a rod. The estate even has its own tackle room where guests can wander among the old rods and reels and study the ancient fish diaries that chronicle previous victories on the river. A nine kilo salmon. How many fish have you caught today, for show? Oh, this year has been very few, I'm afraid. Oh, dear. Next, I meet my fishing guide, Mike Gilly, a local man who knows these waters, whose job it is to see that I catch a fish. Oh, you see, the river is very beautiful today. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? But I'm afraid it's a bit too bright for us. Well, we'll hope. Yes, we hope. When it's coming out of the current, it will fish any longer. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just a, a question of timing. Yeah. Yes. Fine. Fine. Nice. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. With Torshu's yes, gentle fine. coaching, I begin to get the hang of casting flies. However, as you can see, my splendid technique is having no effect on the fish. Well, maybe we should try another spot. Perfectly safe because it's on cable. Yes, three it's cables. It's yeah. Very safe. This one has never but been on one like this before. Yeah. It's wonderful. I would certainly never come out without you. So? Oh. <laughs> I think that's enough. Find a comfortable place to stay. Okay. It's okay? Yep. You want? There. Fine. That oh, that will be interesting to see. What will happen down there now? Uh, obviously, as you can see, the fish don't seem any hungrier here. And just as I was thinking about making my excuses to those I promised the fish to, Torshield called a merciful end to the sporting day. Last cast, I'm afraid. Between 2 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the evening, it's not allowed to fish. Why is that? It, it's, it's for protecting the salmon, oh. not to taking up too many of them. But it seems to be no problem just now. No. No. Uh. <laughs> Olaf, I, I hooked a big salmon that big, but it got away, so I didn't bring <laughs> one for dinner. I'm terribly sorry. But what have but you got no. there? After making my apologies to Olaf, he graciously produced his own wild salmon for us to eat. Oh, now that's... But not before he prepared it in a way I had never seen before. That's great, and that's just butter and herb. Boy, well that looks like... one inside here. That's a great idea, I think. You freeze it. Uh-huh. You always do it this way, Olaf? Yeah. We do it this way, really. Can you do it in the oven if you don't have a grill? You could do it in the oven, but it's difficult with such a big piece of fish. Yes, to get it in, yeah. yes. Just have plenty of foil. Yeah, this is uh, just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Just the beginning. <laughs>
the people who invented aluminum foil so that you juice it up, was it? It could be. <laughs> well, maybe that'll happen tonight and we'll see that. That would be dramatic. Oh, I know. 
of what else? Reindeer, combined with fresh vegetables from his own garden. And mushrooms collected in the local forest. Mm -hmm. Beautifully sauced and plated. Doesn't it look mouthwatering? Looking forward I can hardly wait for tonight. Since it appears Arnie has the cooking well in hand, he certainly doesn't need any help from me. I'll take the opportunity to visit one of the nearby national treasures, the 600-year-old wooden church at Lom. Thank you. 